Hi everyone, welcome to this week's video on evolution. This will be a very brief overview of evolution because I'll try to keep it under 15 minutes. We're going to talk about the evidence to support evolution, showing how species have changed over long periods of time. At the end of this lesson, you'll understand Darwin's inspirations and who he was talking to at the time of his discoveries. You'll be able to explain Darwin's two major theories. Of course, we're talking about adapting and evolving, the A part of Dog Racer. So Darwin, maybe you've heard of him before. To start with something a bit funny, there are these things called Darwin Awards for people who remove themselves from the gene pool by doing stupid things. Their website says that they salute the improvement of the human genome by honoring those who accidentally remove themselves from it in a spectacular manner. Basically, by dying before reproducing, they are improving the future populations. And that earns a Darwin Award. We've previously learned about genes and how certain bad genes can cause disorders and disease. So when an organism reproduces, it passes on pretty much all of their genes. Then, later on, if the offspring survives to adulthood, it can reproduce and then pass on those genes again, and so on and so forth. Organisms that do not get to grow up and become adults that can reproduce cannot pass on their genes. And the idea is that their genes weren't good enough to carry the organism to an age that they can reproduce. They aren't fit. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Before we get too deep into this, let's talk about Darwin a bit. Remember that Darwin guy? Yeah, Charles Darwin is one of the most famous scientists. He wrote about a theory of evolution, and it represented a giant leap in human understanding. Darwin asked why and how creatures came to live here, and then he provided evidence and an explanation. All living things come from other living things. That seems like a fairly reasonable thing to say right now, right? Right now, your answer should be yes, a resounding yes. It is reasonable. But before the 17th century, people believed in spontaneous generation, meaning that living things spontaneously occur from non-living things. And that explained why maggots appeared in old meat and then fish just spontaneously occurred in ponds. However, scientists have performed many experiments to figure this out and found that living things do not occur spontaneously, but they always come from another living thing. Two parts of Darwin's evolutionary theory. The first one, evolution occurs. That's it. Organisms just change over time, very slowly. And the second is that evolution occurs by natural selection. What is natural selection? Well, let's look into Darwin's voyage and how these two ideas came about. In 1831, Darwin joined the HMS Beagle as the ship's naturalist. A naturalist is an expert in natural history. The crew was tasked with a five-year trek around South America to survey the coast and explore the continent. Darwin was able to explore the islands, including the Galapagos. He observed, drew, and collected thousands of specimens for study. He visited tropical rainforests to see new species of plants and animals. He experienced an earthquake that lifted the ocean floor nine feet above sea level, and he found rocks containing fossils of seashells on tall mountains. So he was able to suggest that these two locations having the same kind of species meant that the continents and the oceans have dramatically changed over time and maybe continue to change in dynamic ways. So what do you know about fossils? If we were in class, I would give you one to look at and feel in your hand, but since we're online, here's just a picture. Fossils are the traces of long dead organisms, and we often find them under layers of sedimentary rocks. That's like sand, dust, and other pieces of rock. And those sedimentary layers work from oldest to youngest. So the oldest is on the bottom and the youngest is on top because things get deposited. They get like left over on the earth. So many kinds of fossils can be found at different layers and we can learn about their age by examining where they are found in those layers. In this image, you can see the layers of sediment with different kinds of fossils in them. And this is called the law of superposition. Successive layers are deposited one on top of another so that the lowest layer or stratum is the oldest. When Darwin explored the Galapagos Islands, he made some very important discoveries. He found that each island had different rocks and different animals. He began to hypothesize how those organisms had developed their traits. He began to think about the origin of species. Where did they come from? How did they become so unique and diverse? And one of the major observations he made was the Galapagos finches. The birds varied in size and weight, and especially had different beak sizes and shapes. The birds were highly adapted to their food, 
So instead of fighting over all the same resources on the small island, the finches had diversified and become different species. Finches with longer, thin beaks were able to survive and reproduce because they were able to reach the tiny seeds in flowers. Finches with thick and wide beaks were able to break open large seed pods and then survive and reproduce. Finches with a variation that did not help them with the island's food died out and they did not pass on their variation of beak. So Darwin began to form his ideas and he wrote letters to some of his contemporaries. And we see this quote again. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Darwin's ideas weren't completely original. He was actually influenced by several others. Some previous thinkers and Darwin's contemporaries are Lamarck, Malthus, and Cuvier, Lyell, and Hutton. So Jean-Baptiste Lamarck was a French naturalist, and he proposed that species changed over time. So Darwin was definitely not the first person to think this. However, he believed that traits developed spontaneously. Because the giraffes needed to reach higher to eat the leaves of tall trees, the need to eat stimulated the transmission of longer neck to offspring. That is not how it happens. And we now know that traits developed during a lifetime cannot be passed on to offspring unless it's a germline mutation in an egg cell or sperm cell. So he had the correct idea that species change over time. However, the methodology was not correct. Let's keep going. Thomas Malthus. He argued that human populations are growing faster than the resources they depend on. He was the first dystopian thinker. The Malthus writing was dystopian. Nothing is ever going to get better. He believed that famine and disease break out when populations become too large, and it keeps populations in check by killing off the weakest members. Charles Lyell was a geologist, and Darwin actually took Lyell's book with him on his journey on the HMS Beagle. Lyell argued that geological processes changed the Earth over time, and he believed that the Earth is far older than most people believed, which was a huge difference. So remember that these fellows are working in the early 1800s, and most people at the time believed the world to be around 6,000 years old due to the early biblical tales. However, during this time, people were also open to discussing these stories and began to accept the new calculations. They used stories from the Bible, like the flood, as an example, because the flood was as early a written record that we have where the Earth's surface has changed significantly. So like Lamarck, Darwin assumed that species change over time, and he talked about the variation in species and how important that was, because one variation might be better suited to survive in its environment than other variations. From Lyell, Hutton, and Cuvier, Darwin saw that the Earth was very old. He also took from that that the Earth can gradually change, and therefore so can species. From Malthus, Darwin knew that populations could grow faster than their resources and that overpopulation led to struggle, and Darwin proposed that organisms produce more offspring than can survive so that all populations would be limited by their environment and only the fit would survive. I'm using the term fit because Darwin used fitness to refer to an organism's relative ability to survive and produce fertile offspring. So, nature selects the variations that are most useful. He called it natural selection, meaning some species have certain variations that are not good fits. You don't see any palm trees up in New Hampshire because they are adapted to living down south, where it is almost always warm. One variation is much better suited than the other. One of them will die, and the other will survive. And I thought this quote was rather fitting. It's from the Harry Potter series. Neither can live while the other survives which is also the case in the robin world. So organisms compete for all sorts of things. One of the determinations of fitness is whether or not you can reproduce. So in sexual selection, meaning an organism will select its mate, they will select the mate that will help them produce the most fit offspring. For example, the robin on the left is a male American robin, and on the right is a female American robin. They could select each other as mates. You might notice that the one on the left has a very red chest, and the one on the right is more dull, washed out and faded. This is called sexual dimorphism, meaning the males and females look fairly different. The red on the chest of the male makes it more sexually appealing to the female robin. And you can actually see this in a lot of different species. Males are often more colorful than females. So the red color largely results from a female preference for bright colors. 
for robins, color can also be used in contests. So a conspicuous red color could show that this area is already occupied and that new occupant better fly, fly away. Some studies have also shown that females use the brightness of a male's color as an important indicator of its health and vitality. I'm not going to get into the details of human sexual selection, but if you're interested in this, I can make a whole nother video. Let's move forward and apply the theory of fitness. So let's think about giraffes for a second. Giraffes used to have pretty short necks, but there was a lot of variation. There's short neck giraffes, long neck giraffes, medium length giraffes, but short necked giraffes couldn't reach the tall trees. So they had fewer options to eat from. Long necked giraffes were able to reach those tall trees, but they could also bend over a little and get the shorter trees too. So giraffes with longer necks had an advantage and therefore they had greater fitness. Because they were more fit, they were able to survive and pass on their genetics. Therefore, the new population of giraffes would also have longer necks. And that would just keep continuing until all giraffes had long necks. The short necked giraffes would die. A possible misconception about this is that the individual does not evolve. So an individual short-necked giraffe wouldn't spontaneously grow a long neck. No, it would just die. A longer-necked giraffe would give it an advantage to survive. So that means that your personal genes will not change over time, but if you are unable to reproduce because of some lack of fitness, the population would evolve without your genes. So evolution is in a population over time. So a quick summary, we've talked about selection and competition, adaption to certain environmental characteristics, overproduction or producing many offspring, and variation. So a factor that could spur evolution, that could cause the environment to change, I've listed here. A catastrophic event like a volcano or a tectonic drift, a large asteroid hitting the earth would definitely be a catastrophic event, geographic isolation like the finches on the separate islands, Breeding isolation, meaning maybe one species likes to mate when it's hot out, one species likes to mate when it's cold out, therefore they will never intermingle, as well as seasonal and location isolation. There are two forms of evolution, micro and macro. Microevolution occurs over a relatively short period of time, though still longer than a single lifetime. An example of this are the peppered moths. And you might not be able to see, but there is a moth on the left and there is a black moth on the right. These are the same species with significant variation. The one on the left has a very easy time hiding. The one on the right gets picked off pretty easily and eaten. Therefore, the one on the left is able to pass on its genes far more often than the one on the right. Therefore, there are fewer black moths because they are eaten, but the variation still can occur. During the Industrial Revolution, the trees became darker and the black moths had an easier time hiding and the peppered moth was therefore eaten more and the allele frequency, the number of times this black moth variation appeared versus the peppered moth variation was somewhat skewed. On a macro evolution scale, changes occur over geologic time scales, meaning long, long periods of time, many generations. What happens if a species does not adapt to a changing environment? What if it doesn't evolve? Well, sometimes a species is entirely wiped out. This is a representation of dodo birds. Dodo birds were flightless birds. They lived in Mauritius near Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. It was about three feet tall, according to the fossils we found, and it was very well adapted for its ecosystem. It was able to hide with a brownish-gray plumage. It had gizzard stones to help digest food, which was probably fruits, because it lived in the woods where fruits were abundant. Until the bird became hunted by sailors, an invasive species, and its habitat was being destroyed. And it was not immediately noticed, but the dodo birds are now extinct. The last widely accepted sighting of a dodo bird was 1662. They were not able to adapt to the changes in their environment. So extinctions are the end of a species, meaning they can't produce any more descendants, they're done. And it is estimated that 99% of all species that have ever lived on Earth have become extinct. That's a lot. Let's summarize. Darwin's two theories are as follows. One, evolution occurs. And these changes occur in populations, not individuals. Changes are passed on genetically. And descendants diverge from common ancestors. So variation occurs and then they can split and become new species. And the second, evolution occurs via natural selection. 
meaning fitness, is an organism's relative ability to survive, reproduce, and produce fertile offspring. It's been 150 years since Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species, and his ideas remain central to scientific exploration. So let's think about it for a moment. Is evolution occurring today? At the bottom of your notes, I would like you to write a short paragraph discussing what you think would happen if there were no more mosquitoes in New Hampshire. You now can provide evidence to support how species have changed over time. You know about Darwin's inspirations and contemporaries. And you can explain Darwin's two major theories. So that's all for today. Take care of yourself and stay safe. Signing off. Miss later.